Hi everybody, Captain Al speaking with your training tips designed to help make you a better, more knowledgeable flight simmer, pilot, or aviation enthusiast. Have a seat, let's strap in and stow the HUD and see what is on the horizon for today. Our briefing today will cover, under the category of flight training, we're looking at flow patterns. Uh, this will be part one of flow patterns for the PMDG 747-400. Flow patterns are procedures. They usually go before checklists and they're usually done from memory. Checklists are designed to back up flow patterns. So when you do a particular flow pattern, it's followed by a checklist and that checklist should back up that flow pattern. Not all items are necessarily covered on the checklist. That's up to specific airline to decide what's covered and what's not. The captain has specific flow procedures, and the first officer has specific flow procedures that he or she does. The first officer does the most. He or she has the most to do. Um, the captain does the least. And the flight simmer, well, he has to do it all. He or she. In part one of flow patterns, we'll look at the before start procedure, which will be followed by the before start checklist. We'll look at the before taxi procedure, which is sometimes called the after start procedure, which goes before the before taxi checklist or the after start checklist. And then as we taxi out, we have specific taxi duties to accomplish. And then there's certain lineup procedures that are done as well prior to takeoff. And in part two, we'll look at setting up uh, the descent and approach and procedures associated with those, normally then followed by the descent and approach checklist. And then after landing, we'll look at the after landing procedure which is normally followed by an after landing checklist. And then once we arrive at the gate, there'll normally be a shutdown procedure or parking procedure, depending on what the airline calls it. And then followed by a shutdown checklist or a parking checklist. And then to complete the flight, there may be a securing procedure and then a securing checklist, or sometimes it could be called termination, uh, procedure and termination checklist. Again, there's different words that airlines can use for these specific procedures. Uh, in this particular case with part one and part two of flow patterns, we are not gonna cover the checklist. That'll be covered in a separate module where we'll look at two checklists. One will be a generic Boeing checklist that's used uh, in the PMDG licensing model. And then the other checklist we'll look at is one that I've developed, which is called the subsonic uh, flight training uh, checklist for the 747-400. And of course, there are uh, specific flow patterns that the first officer does, we'll cover those. There's specific flow patterns that the captain does, we'll cover those. And then, of course, the flight simmer, you really got to put those two together because the flight simmer has to do everything because you are the entire crew. So let's head on over to the virtual simulator. Okay, we're in the uh, virtual simulator now. And uh, just a recap of where we are. Uh, we're at the point where we have um, already established electrical power. If electrical power was not established, we would have done the safety check and electrical power up procedure and we would have established AC power with uh, external or the EPU. Uh, we then adjusted our lighting. We did the preliminary pre-flight procedure. Um, one of the pilots did the FMS CDU pre-flight procedure. We've done our captain and first officer scan flow procedure. Once we finished that, we adjusted our seat, adjusted our rudder pedals, 
and the captain called for the pre-flight checklist. We've accomplished the pre-flight checklist and we're at the point where we continue from there. Now, if you haven't seen any of these uh, video briefings or training tips on these areas, go back and uh, view them. They are detailed video briefings. Um, the safety check, electrical power, preliminary pre-flight is one video briefing. The lighting, exterior and interior is another one. Uh, the pre-flight procedure with the CDU is another video. And the captains and first officers uh, scan flow procedures would be another video. Um, checklist we haven't gotten into yet, but we'll uh, do that in the next video briefing. And we'll accomplish, uh, actually cover two checklists, the Boeing checklist and uh, my own checklist, which is the subsonic uh, flight training checklist. We'll talk about that in the video briefing. So we're at the point now where we've completed the pre-flight check. And the next thing we can do is normally get the ATIS, and after we get the ATIS, get the ATC clearance. Um, we're in the States, so we can get the ATC clearance well ahead of time. So let's go get the ATIS. Uh, we can do that at Seattle. Um, we do have digital ATIS here, but we don't have the capability of getting that. So uh, we've tuned uh, 118.0 on the right radio. And we'll switch over to right so we can get that. Okay, information Sierra at Seattle. There's a broken clouds. The temperature's one zero, and the uh, winds it looks like out of the east, pretty light. And the altimeter was uh, three zero zero one. So the next thing we do is call for our clearance, and we'll assume we did that. And they gave us that we're cleared to the. San Francisco International Airport, uh, departing runway 16 left via the Harab 5 departure, FIPOT transition, flight plan route, climb and maintain 6000, expect flight level 390 five minutes after departure, departure control frequency on 119 or decimal 2, and we'll say squawk 4223. Uh, and we'll say that's our clearance for the sake of uh, time. And so we can go down to our transponder and set our code 4223. And of course, normally we'd set our uh, mode control panel at this time as well, but we're going to wait till we get our final numbers for that. Um, typically on the line, you'll set it now. Uh, most people, when they get the clearance, will reach up there and put the initial heading in and initial altitude in. And, um, for Boeing procedures, we normally wait till we get our final papers on board and then we set the MCP. So we kind of sit on our hands until we get our final paperwork. So we won't set that for now. Once we have our uh, ATIS and ATC clearance, uh, then we are waiting for our final papers. Okay, we just received our uh, final paperwork. We have our final numbers at this time. We check the final zero fuel weight and it says 493.5. So we'll check that against the uh, performance initialization page. 493.5, it's unchanged. That gives us a gross weight of 551.0. That's in pounds. Also shows our final CG is 21%, and that's unchanged from our preliminary, so that gives us a trim of 5.8. That gives us a uh, takeoff decision speed V1 of 123 knots, rotate speed VR of 133 knots, and takeoff safety speed or V2 of 150 knots. 
So once we have all that information, now we can set the MCP. So we'll go up to the mode control panel and we'll set our V2 speed of 150 in. Since we're flying a SID departure, the Harob 5 departure feedpot transition, and that is on the legs page. We'll go ahead and our MELNAV, and the preferred pitch mode on takeoff will be VNAV, so arm VNAV. And then we'll set our initial heading, which we're departing runway 16 left, so runway heading there is 163, we'll set that in. And then we're going to set our initial altitude, which is um, 6,000. So now you see we either set four items or five items. The four items would be set V2, arm VNAV, initial heading, initial altitude. And that would be if you're flying uh, runway heading for radar vectors and you don't have a SID departure. If you have a SID departure like we do today, then it's five items. We'll set V2, arm LNAV, arm VNAV, set initial heading, and set initial altitude. So in this case, it's these five items, V2, LNAV, VNAV, initial heading, initial altitude. Once we have that done, now we have our clearance. Uh, we've set up the clearance. We've set the MCP because we have our final numbers, and now we can do a crew briefing. Uh, the crew briefing is generally done by the pilot flying, could be done by the captain, just depends on the airline's SOPs. It can be uh, long and elaborate, or it can be short and concise, and uh, some things can just be standard in a briefing uh, that are, are known by the airline's SOPs, and you don't necessarily have to spell it out. Um, I'll do a short crew briefing today to um, demonstrate it and to accomplish it in the sequence of events that we're doing. So this will be a left seat takeoff. We'll be departing uh, Seattle on runway 16 left. Uh, we'll be TO2 thrust today, flap 10 takeoff. And that is good for runway 16 left as far as the analysis goes for performance. We're going to be flying the Harob 5 departure with the FIPOT transition. We'll be maintaining 6,000, expecting flight level 390 five minutes after departure. And the Harob 5 departure does have a restriction at uh, Renby to cross Renby at or above 3,000 to maintain 6,000. And that should be absolutely no problem at our weight today. Expected taxi route is to push back from Sierra 10, contact ramp control. They'll probably clear us up to box 88, at which point we'll contact ground. When we contact ground, we're expecting uh, straight ahead right on Bravo, taxi uh, via Bravo to 16 left, full length departure at uh, intersection Charlie. There are no hot spots during the taxi today. Once we depart, um, the highest terrain is to the east. That's at 6400 or above. Uh, well, 6400 and below. Um, we're departing to the west and then to the south, so the minimum sector in that area is to the west is uh, 3,400, and then it drops off as we go south to 2,200, so uh, terrain shouldn't be a problem. And uh, emergency actions, anything up to 80 knots, we're in the low speed regime, call it out, we'll reject the takeoff. If we reject, I'll call reject, I'll bring the thrust levers to idle, I'll disconnect the auto throttle. Uh, I'll manually deploy the speed brakes and I'll lift the reversers till the interlock releases and then I'll go reverse on all engines. Uh, the runway is dry today so that should not be a problem. You note the takeoff speed, call the tower. Once we stop the airplane, uh, we'll assess the situation. We'll stay on the runway until we're sure we can clear the runway. Above 80 knots, we start to get into the high speed regime. So now we're going to reject for any engine fire, any fire, engine failure, predictive wind shear, or any unsafe condition that would uh, not allow the airplane to fly. As we approach V1, we're more likely to continue. At or above V1, we will continue with a positive rate. We'll get the gear up. 
and then we won't take any action on any item until at least 400 feet. Above 400 feet it'll be uh, my discretion to initiate a uh, any kind of uh, action item, like a memory item, if we have to shut down an engine, uh, then we'll do so above 400 feet if it's severe damage. If it's not severe damage, we'll go ahead and uh, continue, clean up, and then when the workload is lower, then we'll secure the engine. And then from there, we'll assess the situation and decide what to do. Uh, I believe in a team atmosphere, so if there's anything you see that you don't like, speak up. I'll keep an eye on you, you keep an eye on me, and uh, don't be afraid to be vocal. It is a team atmosphere. Any questions? No questions. Okay, so that would be an example of a uh, crew briefing. And uh, again, they, they can vary in length by airline depending on uh, how elaborate you want to get them. Some can be very short and you can say, you know, standard emergency procedures. And then within that would be some of the things that I mentioned and that uh, but we're expected to know them. Once we uh, finish the uh, crew briefing, we're pretty much ready to go at this point. We're waiting for the uh, any final paperwork if the gate agent comes up and we sign the dispatch release and give it to the gate agent and then they uh, will close the doors and then we're going to check that the doors are closed and we'll check if external power is removed. So let's check the door synoptic now just to see that. All the doors are closed. They're in the automatic mode. And we'll go up and see that we have external power still plugged in, but we switched over to the APU <coughs> well ahead of departure. So we could call the flight deck to ground. Uh, you are cleared to remove external power at this time. And they would go ahead and then remove external power. We'll go ahead and do that. So we see that external power is removed, the doors are closed, uh, the cabin is ready. So if we're expecting no delays, we can then call the uh, ground personnel in the uh, nose for permission to pressurize hydraulics and then we'll do our before start procedure and then we'll do our before start checklist and then we get a pushback clearance anticipating that there's no delays. If we think there might be delays, then we could hold on the before start and call and find out if there are any delays so we don't do a procedure and checklist without having without having to. So in this case, let's call the uh, ground personnel. We could go down to the uh, audio panel. We could go to flight. Or we could simply take our control column switch and go to interphone as well. And say, uh, flight deck to ground, we'd like to uh, pressurize hydraulics at this time and verify the nose gear steering is locked out. And he would tell us you're cleared to pressurize and the nose gear steering is locked out. And we want it locked out for the uh, pushback and we just verify that with him. And then we can go back up to our overhead panel. And now we're going to start the first flow, which is the before start uh, procedure, followed by the before start checklist. So the before start procedures, the uh, FO has most of the stuff to do. Um, the captain has a very limited function on what he does. Most of it's FO. Of course, as flight simmers, we have to do everything. So where we start is at the hydraulic panel. We're going to bring number four to aux. And we bring number one to aux if we had it, like on a freighter, perhaps. I'm in a passenger airplane, so I don't have the aux position on number one. So I'm just going to go to auto. 
number one, two, and three to auto. We always want to pressurize the normal brake system first uh, so that there's no transfer of fluid. So normally we go number four to aux, number one, two, and three to auto, or if you're in a freighter, number four to aux, number one to aux, and number two and three to auto. And then from there we're going to go over to the fuel panel and we're going to turn on the uh, tanks containing usable fuel. We probably already have checked that, but if we haven't, we could go to the fuel panel. And we can see that we have nothing in the center, nothing in the stab. We do have the fuel in main tanks 1, 2, 3, and 4. We don't care that they're tanked to engine right now. We'll configure that uh, when the message tells us to. But for now, we're just looking for what kind of fuel we have and what tanks. And we have tanks in 1, 2, 3, and 4. We have no fuel in the center, no fuel in the stab. So we're going to go ahead and uh, configure for that. So we come upstairs and we will start to turn on the pumps. These lights are at, these uh, switches are actually pretty hot with the pressure lights uh, illuminated. So if you linger your finger on there for any period of time, you, they, you actually generate heat there. So we're going to turn on main tanks one, two, three, and four, including the overrides. There's nothing in the center, nothing in the stab, so we don't turn those on. But the cross feeds were all open from the cockpit setup, and so that's how we want to configure our fuel panel. And we'll come over and turn the beacon to um, both. And then we'll come downstairs and make sure we have engine displayed. And we'll push recall. Now when we push recall, we should see some uh, messages. Engine 1, 2, 3, 4 shut down, they're normal. Um, TCAS off is because the uh, TCAS at this point is, we want to see TCAS off displayed on the NDs. The, the um, transponder is in standby right now. Uh, we are going to be turning this to uh, transponder um, shortly as well, since there is ground radar at Seattle Tacoma and we have a fuel tank to engine message and this is where we see this now so because we have the tank to engine message now we can configure tank to engine so again we can go to the fuel synoptic and just make sure it truly is tank to engine which it is main tank 2 is less than main tank 1 main tank 3 is less than or equal to main tank 4 so we are tank to engine so now we'll go up to the fuel panel and now we'll configure tank to engine. We'll do that by turning off the override pumps first and then turning off cross feeds one and four. And when you do that you should see the tank to engine message go away. And now if you look at the synoptic you can see you are a uh, tank to engine at this point. These are normal messages, so once we check them, we could go ahead and cancel them at this time. Now what does the captain do? Well, he doesn't do much. He basically just uh, sets his trim. And so if we come down to the uh, trim here, the um, trim was uh, on the takeoff reference page was 6.0, so we could set that. You can see it's pretty well set already. I'll just kind of move it to show that I'm setting it. And he would also check that we have uh, zero on the rudder trim. And he's also going to check that he has uh, get a shot of it. That he also has zero here. Zero on the aileron trim, zero on the rudder trim and he set the stabilizer trim to um, six units or it looks like it now 5.8 looks like it is so we can go back down there and set and you're a better man than I if you can set 
So let's go down here and set uh, just a little less than 6. Maybe about right there, 5.8. Remember, it's ballpark. You can't really see specific individual units, but you can get it in the ballpark. The main thing to check that it's in the green band, which it is. And so that's the uh, before start uh, procedure. So once again, just to review that, because the flight simmer pretty much has to do everything. Uh, number four will go to aux, number one, two, three to auto, or aux, aux, auto, auto. Um, turn the fuel pumps on for the tanks containing usable fuel. If you don't know what that is, go check the synoptic to see what it is and turn all the pumps on. If we had fuel in the center, we would have turned the center tank pumps on. In this case, we didn't have that. We just had fuel in tanks one, two, three, and four. So we turned on main tanks one, overrides, two, mains, mains, overrides, and four. One, two, three, and four. We turned them on. We came down, turned the beacon to both. And then we came down to the lower panel here and we checked uh, recall and checked our messages. Engine 1, 2, 3, 4 shutdown is normal. TKS off is normal in, in this particular simulator. In the real simulator, you actually don't get the TKS off. Even though you have TKS off display, the, you don't get an ICAST message for that. So we just see shutdown messages in the real simulator. Um, here we get the TKS off. That's fine. That's normal. And we did get the tank to engine, so that's when we configured tank to engine at that time. We checked it, made sure it truly was tank to engine. And then we went back up and configured tank to engine. We did that by turning the overrides off and, uh, and cross feeds 1 and 4 we turned off. Once we did that, we can cancel these messages. You know what they are. And uh, the captain, meanwhile, he has set his trim to 5.8 units. And he checks 0 on the rudder trim and 0 on the aileron trim. And that completes the before start procedure. And then we would call for the before start checklist, which we'll cover in another module. The other thing we do on the before start procedure is just make sure the uh, pilot flying, in this case the captain, is on the takeoff reference page and the uh, pilot monitoring is on the legs page. So depending on who's flying, takeoff reference here, legs here, or takeoff reference here, legs page here. And that's just kind of done automatically. It is part of the procedure, but it's um, usually after you end up with your CDU pre-flight, you put your page on the page that will be on for takeoff. So if I'm the flying today as the captain, which I briefed I was, I'd be I'd have the takeoff reference page uh, up on my side. He'd have legs page up on his side. At this point, we're ready to call for a uh, pushback clearance. So we call ramp control, and request uh, you know, subsonic uh, 44 heavy. We're at uh, gate Sierra 10. We're ready to push and start. And then ramp control will give us a clearance to push and, uh, you know, whatever specific instructions there are, tail east or whatever. So in this case, we'll go ahead and uh, push back. And let's go to the menu page and go to FS actions, and go to push back. And we'll, let's see, 250 is good, left turn, 90 degrees, it's all fine. And we'll, uh, and we'll start that. Cockpit to ground. Go ahead. We've been cleared for pushback and start. They want the tail to our left. Roger that. Ready for pushback. Tail to the left. Release burn brick, please. Brakes released. So now we'll start the pushback. I don't know if you noticed that, but I didn't have the parking brake set. That would have been done in the... Uh, that would have been done on the um, 
cockpit setup, uh, part of the captain's duty as he comes through the thrust quadrant is to set the parking brake. And um, I kind of did a modified setup here, so didn't do a full setup. So the parking brake was not set there. I set it just prior to uh, releasing it, if you notice that on the memo message. So we can go outside here and see if we're being pushed, which we are. And at some airports, uh, you may be able to start during pushback. At other airports, they may have to push you back into the alley and then you know, once you're in a position, in a better position, then they may clear you to start. So sometimes you can start in the pushback, sometimes you can't. We'll wait till we're fully pushed back before we start. You'll notice our memo messages tell us right now that the doors are in auto, the APU is running, and the auto brakes are in RTO. Our ICAS again is, uh, does have these messages, but we do cancel them for start. We want to see a blank screen here for start. And once we're pushed back, you know, then we'll, again, the normally the first officer would make sure that uh, we're still an engine down here. And he is going to be the one to. Uh, Turn two of the packs off, or all three packs off. Normally, we turn just two packs off. Push back complete. Parking brake set. So we'll go ahead and set the parking brake. You can see brake the memo message. Steering pin is pulled. Watch for the salute and release from guidance on your right. Have a good flight. Okay. Normally, we would tell him to. Uh, but, uh, you know, normally we'd want to keep him with us until all four engines are started. And then at that point, we'd say, okay, we've got four good starts. You're cleared to disconnect. Show me the pin on the left side. So long. Then he'd say, have a good flight. And uh, disconnect at that point. So we'll go upstairs here. We'll turn two packs off. Again, you could turn three off. Normally, two is sufficient. And then we can come down and check our duct pressure. It's adequate. With the APU, there is no minimum duct pressure. If you were doing an external start, 30 psi would be the minimum, less one psi per thousand feet of a pressure altitude. But normally, uh, with the APU, um, when we initiate the start, the APU is going to boost the air and so it doesn't, there is no minimum duct pressure that's required. So we'll say we're cleared on uh, to start all engines at this time. So normally the captain would command start three and four, the first officer will reach up and he'll start three and four. With auto start you can start two engines at a time. If we were doing a manual start because auto start was not working, then we'd start one engine at a time. But uh, no problem starting two engines at a time. So we'll come up to the start switches and we'll pull out number three. And we'll pull out number four. And then we'll go down to our fuel control switches. And we'll start three and four. And uh, we, you know, monitor that we have uh, rotation, we have well pressure, we have N1 rotation. Uh, in some airlines, this is a call. You know, they have to call rotation, oil pressure, N1. In other airlines, it's silent. You verify that it does these, but uh, you don't have to call it out. So you can see in this case, auto start is starting engines three and four. 
We do have good rotation of N2, we have good oil pressure, we have good N1, we have light off, we have EGT rise, and then we're checking for EGT peaks, it comes back down, the red tick mark goes away, and then N1 and N2 are stabilized at idle. Typically you're going to see about 20, you know, right what we have about here, about 20 some percent, 24 percent, and about 65 percent on the N2. So 20 and 60 is, you know, kind of what you're looking for in that range, that it's stabilized. And again, the red tick marks are gone from the EGT. And so then we would say start uh, 1 and 2. So the first officer would come up here and he'd pull number one, and he'd pull number two. And then of course we'll go down to our fuel control switches. And we'll start uh, number one and number two. And I'll go back up here and monitor it. Again, you can see we have rotation of N2. We've got good oil pressure. And we've got N1 rotation. And now we have light off. That's what we're checking for. And sometimes it's a call out, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's silent. As the EGT rises and peaks, the EGT tick marks uh, will go away. And of course, auto start will take care of a lot of different engine problems. Maybe we'll do a start segment on that. Uh, manual starts and auto starts and what it's looking at and things like that. So again, we're checking that we have stabilized idle. Tick marks go away, stabilized at about 24, 25%, maybe 23%. And the uh, it's about 65% uh, here, 62, 63, 64, somewhere in that range. Uh, we do have an ICAST message electrical generator off, and that could be just because of something I was doing prior to this. So we won't go bother doing the checklist, we're just going to reset that. And that was probably something I was doing prior to this. You'll get a high, an ICAST message here, hydraulic pressure demand 4 when you started the engine. That's a normal message. We would cancel that and get rid of it. But that's a normal message to get on start. Once you have four good starts, captain would disconnect the ground personnel again. and say, you know, flight deck to ground. Uh, you've got four good starts. You're cleared to disconnect. Show me the pin on the left side. And we'll see you next time. He says, so long. And he goes away and then he's going to show you the pin on the left side and salute you and, and off he goes. So now we get to the uh, next part of the flow, which is the before taxi procedure followed by the before taxi checklist. Um, this could also be called after start. Now Boeing calls it before taxi, but uh, some airlines will call it after start procedure. Uh, because this is after the engines are running at this point. Again, most of the flow pattern comes with the uh, first officer. He does most, most everything. Um, so at this point, we're going to start the flow with the APU. We want to turn the APU off. We want to come down and turn the number four to auto. Remember, if it's a freighter, we'd also turn number one to auto, number one to auto, number four to auto, if you have an aux position. If not, this is a passenger airplane, so we just came down and put number one to auto. Uh, we come over here, the next step in the flow is to come to the nacelle anti-ice. Um, depending on whether you have icing conditions, which we don't today, we'll just leave the switches in auto. If we had icing conditions, we would turn the nacelle anti-ice on. Um, these are the auto uh, switches. You might have switches that look like this, look like alternate action switches, in which case they would be off and on. 
we have off, auto, and on. And we leave the switches normally in auto, so in the air they would automatically operate if there's ice detected to turn on the, on the cell any ice. So in our case today, we would just, the flow does APU off, number four to auto, and then come over here to the cell any ice if required. In our case today, it's not required. We can just leave it in auto. We don't have icing conditions. Then we'll come over and turn the uh, aft cargo heat on. We want it on. And uh, we'll turn the packs to normal. And then from there, we'll come down and select our flaps to flaps 10. Depending on the airline, sometimes the captain will call for this. He'll say flaps 10 or flaps 20. And then the first officer would respond as part of his flow to give him flaps 10 or 20. In other cases, you can just select flaps 10 or 20. It just depends on the airline. And this straight Boeing procedure is just to select the flaps. You don't have to wait for the captain to command them. And then we would come down to our, we'll do it right here, we would come down to our transponder and go to transponder since we need that for taxiing today because they have ground radar at uh, Seattle. Now if they don't, you wouldn't, although I've heard something recently where you, you put it in transponder all the time now. Uh, but at stations that didn't have ground radar, you never you used to just stay in standby. And I think that may have changed now. Now, meanwhile, the um, captain, what does he do? That's about all the FO does. But what does the captain do? Well, he's got to do, he doesn't do much. Again, he's pretty lazy. So the first officer would bring up, in addition, he's going to bring up the uh, status page as well. And so he'll come down and you know, once he, he'll also select status. And then the captain will do the flight control check. So that's really all he's waiting for is to do the flight control check. Uh, we'll do ailerons first and then elevators and then rudders. And so with the aileron, you'll notice we're going to see three up and two down. Three up on the right side, two down on the left side. Because we're seeing the spoiler panel move up. And we want to go full deflection, and we want to make sure it is uh, correct, that it's in the proper direction. And that is correct, right up and left down, to make a right turn. And now if we go to the left, we should see three up and two down, which we do. And if we go with the elevators, two down, we're looking at the uh, position transmitters for the uh, outboard elevators because if you know if the outboards are moving, the inboards are moving because the inboards are mechanically latched to the outboards. So you only have two indices, but it's looking at really all four elevator surfaces. And it'll go two up. Again, we check full displacement and back to neutral. And then we'll check two left on the rudders. It's the upper and the lower rudder. Full deflection. And of course, two right. Full deflection. If we go outside and look at this, uh, you can see if I go to the right, you can see that the uh, right inboard and outboard aileron lift up. You'll notice the spoilers. Uh, the outboard five lift up. Those are the ones that assist in roll control. And the left side stays down except the uh, ailerons, the inboard and outboard ailerons have gone down. But the spoilers are seated. They don't come up in this case. If we go back to neutral, if we go to the left, we're seeing the left aileron, inboard and outboard go up. We see the spoiler panels go up uh, differentially. You can see there's more movement on the uh, outboards than the inboard spoilers. Notice the outboard five are the ones that move up. The six spoiler on the inboard portion doesn't uh, is not used to assist in roll control, so that doesn't come up. 
And then if we go two down for the elevator, uh, again, you're seeing all four surfaces go down. The position transmitters are, are right here. They're on the outboards. But the elevator is linked. When we move the, the control column, it's linked to the inboards. And if the inboards move, they send a signal to the outboards to move. So you know if the outboards are moving, the inboards are moving. So that's why you have two indices. The two indices are looking at the outboard elevators only. But you know if the outboards are moving, the inboards are moving because the inboards are what move the outboards. So we'll go uh, full aft, looks like that. Full down, looks like that. And then of course we'll go full uh, rudder to the right and full rudder to the left. So this is what it looks like from the outside if you were doing it. Right aileron neutral, left aileron neutral, elevator down, neutral, elevator up, neutral, rudder right, neutral, and rudder left, neutral. And of course when you do this on the control column you do it smooth and deliberate you don't want to slam it to the stops you know because there's 3,000 psi of hydraulics going out to these uh, surfaces and so you do it smoothly and not uh, abruptly. And then from there the uh, captain would call for the before taxi checklist. Once the flight control uh, is done uh, then the first officer would reach up here and select status again and blank the lower ICAS. And after that, he is going to push recall and check that there's uh, any messages. And TCAS off is a known message. We still don't, we're still in transponder, so we don't have RATA uh, on the transponder yet. So this is a normal message. Um, and again, interestingly enough, in the simulator, you don't actually get this message. So I don't know if it's inhibited or um, maybe it's optionable that you don't get it when on the ground when you have TCAS off. But uh, certainly in the PMDG model, this is reasonable because we do have TCAS off displayed here. So we verify that and then uh, cancel it, get rid of it. And then the first officer would get out the before taxi checklist and read it. Once the uh, before taxi checklist is complete, uh, then the captain would say taxi clearance. And the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, and the first officer in this case would um, call ramp control in this case and say uh, ramp uh, subsonic 44 heavy, we're ready to taxi coming out of Sierra 10. And then he'd say, uh, you know, you're cleared up to uh, box 88, reaching box 88, switch to ground, uh, point, uh, whatever it is here at Seattle, point, I think it's point seven or something like that. So in this case, we'd go ahead then and uh, release the brake, make sure it's uh, again clear left and clear right. And then we can start our taxi. We have to be very mindful of breakaway thrust. We usually don't want to have more than you know 40 to 45 percent at the most breakaway thrust. Doesn't take much to start moving the airplane, especially depending on weight. We're pretty light today, so it's going to start to move pretty much right away. But uh, normally 40 to 45 percent is good for breakaway thrust. And we would come up to uh, box 80, which would be up here somewhere. Um, not sure the model has it in there, and then we contact ground. And he'd say you can make a uh, right turn on Bravo and taxi to runway 16 left. Yeah, we don't have the markings here for that um, box 80. So once we get to that, we'd switch to ground, then he'd clear us to the runway, which we're, we've been cleared at this point.
Of course, as you taxi, you remember that if you have to make turns, you have to lead the turns. Typically, when it's off your right shoulder, the uh, center line of where you're turning, you know, like somewhere right about now, you can start the turn. Ideally, your taxi speed going straight ahead should be, well, you know, on a straight, a long straight taxiway like this, you could go up to 20 to 30 knots. 30 knots would be max, 20 would be more typical. So we'll increase the speed a little bit here. And of course, normally you want to put your, you know, when you're taxiing, you want to put your right knee on the center line. And that'll be pretty close to being on the center line. So if I'm, you know, taxiing from the left seat. So it would be, you know, maybe, let's see, right about uh, here would probably be pretty close to the center line. Take a look outside. Yeah, it's pretty close. Let's see, I could beat the left just a little bit, it looks like. So probably somewhere right about uh, maybe about right in here would be in the center line. So as we taxi um, and we approach the end of the runway, let's say we're approaching the end of the runway at this time, um, at some point I would tell the uh, first officer, I'm going to be in weather, you be in terrain. So I'll select weather and he'll select terrain on his side. Increase our speed a little bit just to get us down there. This is a long taxi way. You can see pretty close to the center line. And that's just about off my right knee, right there. Looks pretty good on the center line. Next thing I would call for is the uh, before takeoff checklist. And then we'd complete the before takeoff checklist. We'll cover that in the checklist uh, section. And then as we take the runway, there's a certain lineup items that'll uh, be done on the uh, it's mainly the FO again. He's going to turn on the uh, strobe lights and he's going to get the uh, transponder to TARA. And he can turn on whatever other lights he wants. Uh, we can turn on all our lights except the inboard landing lights and then the inboard landing lights would come on when we're clear for takeoff so taking the runway you could turn on all the other lights uh, for at night we maybe don't want to blind anybody we might want to hold on the outboard landing lights till we're on the runway and pointing down the runway Of course, as we turn on taxiways, on a dry taxiway like this, uh, 10 knots or less is fine for uh, making a 
any turn that's you know more than 30 degrees you're going to want to be slowed down so as we approach the end here we'll slow to about 10 knots And again, we would call the tower, and let's say we've been uh, line up and wait, runway 16 to the left, and we lead the turn by a little bit. Approaching 16 left. On runway, one, six, left. You can see I overshot the turn just a little bit. Actually, a little easier to do this in the airplane than it is uh, <laughs> in the desktop simulator. So as we take the runway, now that I'm stopped, we can do the uh, lineup items. Uh, the lineup items would be to uh, bring the transponder to TARA and to go up and get our strobe lights on. And uh, we probably had our taxi light on already. That would have been commanded as we started our taxi, taxi light on. And then as we tag take the runway, we could, uh, well, we could turn our turnoffs on if we wanted to. We could turn our outboard landing lights on if we desired to. We just leave the inboards off until we're clear for takeoff. Once we're clear for takeoff, then we'd reach up and turn the inboard uh, landing lights on. And then at that point, we're pretty much ready to go. So we'll stop this uh, right here. This covered the uh, sequence of events from the uh, point where we completed our pre-flight checklist and the sequence of events that lead us out to the end of the runway and some of the major flow patterns. Again, the flow patterns we covered were the before start procedure, the before taxi procedure, and the uh, takeoff procedure. Of course, one other thing we want to verify is as we're taking the runway, we'd want to verify that uh, it's the correct runway and we're going to check our heading as we take the runway. We'll check our map to make sure the map agrees that we're on the proper runway. And we would see that we're at 1-6 left at whatever intersection it is. And we'd verbalize all that to make sure that uh, we are taking the correct runway. Because runway incursions are such a big deal. Um, in the last uh, 10 years, it's still been a problem uh, that runway incursions uh, still occur on somewhat of a regular basis. So with that, we'll stop this video and then we'll do the uh, rest of the flow patterns in part two. Thanks for watching. Okay, let's lower the HUD and go flying. Until our next briefing, keep the blue side up. Captain Al, out.